Uh, real quickly, I, I, we're just um, incredibly blessed today to have with us uh, one of the most influential women in, in the world. Uh, Gretchen Carlson is with us today. Can we put our hands together? Uh, amazing. Gretchen, um, important to note here that uh, Gretchen is not just a TV personality, uh, you know, on Fox uh, News Network. She uh, is actually um, a very renowned um, concert violinist. She also uh, is a, a, a leader in the world in the way that she does humanitarian work. She happens to be a former Miss America, by the way. That's pretty awesome. Uh, and uh, she also on top of all that is a mom of, of two and a, and a devoted wife and just a, a, a Christ follower. We're just honored to have her with us. I can't wait for you guys to get to know more uh, about this incredible leader through just a, a time of Q&A. Uh, she's also, the, I, I, she doesn't ever bring this up in her um, bio, but uh, as I was reading her book a little bit, found out she's also, um, uh, she was the valedictorian of her school. She went to Stanford and Oxford, all right? So, wow, right? Wow, and so just very impressive. And so um, can we just put our hands together for the great Gretchen Carlson, honored to have you. Thank you so much, David. You bet, man. And by the way, after listening to LU Send, I want to come back to Liberty U. Yes. I have to tell you <laughs> that some of the most life-changing moments and events for me were on religious trips to Israel with my family growing up as a child and having the opportunity to see the world from a different perspective is so incredible in how you grow to be an adult later on and to appreciate what you have here in this great country and how you can help other people. So I would just, I didn't even know about it until I got here today, but I think I'm gonna enroll. I'm gonna come we along We will take with. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, listen, uh, Sean Hannity's wife just graduated, Jill Hannity, from here with our online program. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I'd like to go ahead and give you an application right now <laughs> to join us while you're on TV. Uh, so I wanna put, uh, since it's not an afterthought in your life, and it is um, really a foundation in your life, I wanna bring the first question before you about your faith. Um, you are very outspoken. When I watch you on TV, you're always talking about your faith. You're always uh, personalizing stories. Uh, Notice the other day how everybody's talking about God since the Pope is with us in this country right now. You, you, you tend to always talk about God, whether it's the, the conversation of the moment or not. How, tell us about your faith. I mean, were there, uh, is this something new? Was, did you grow up in a Christian home, or is there a heritage of faith, or were you the first in your family to come to Christ? Just tell us a little bit about just your walk with the Lord. I know you also, you and your husband teach Sunday school we do. where you are. Yes. Yeah. It's the one hour a week that I know I'm going to actually see him <laughs> and be with our kids at the same time, which is really wonderful. David, I was so blessed to grow up in a family and we were all Christians. My grandfather was a minister. I grew up in a small town in Minnesota. And Minnesota? Minnesota. And so I spent a tremendous amount of time in the church growing up, whether it was performing my violin or teaching Sunday school or singing in the church choir or going on mission trips. And it really just became the foundation of my life. And I've been so blessed to keep that as the main foundation in my life. I think it is the greatest gift that we can give to our children. And especially in these ever more difficult times that you guys are growing up in and that I'm raising my kids in who are 10 and 12, it's just really important to, to give that foundation that I was so lucky to have as well. Yeah, well, obviously we, we know you not just as an author and a humanitarian, but we also know you, most of us, just from watching you on TV. Uh, uh, you know, uh, for years you were on the mornings and then I think, I guess you just said, hey, you know what? I'm gonna let somebody else do that. I'm gonna go <laughs> at two in the afternoon. Well, actually it was a great professional and personal move. I had done Fox and Friends for eight years where I set three alarms for 3.30 a.m. And it was a wonderful opportunity to combine hard news with having fun at the same time. And it really was my ultimate goal in life to reach that pinnacle. And the chairman of our company came to me and said, you know, I'd love to give you a new opportunity, which is so important in life to always challenge yourself again to take on a new goal no matter how old you are or how young you are. And so professionally, it was just so wonderful to be offered the opportunity to do my own show. And the hours weren't bad either, because it was gonna be at 2 p.m. Eastern. And my kids, from a personal level, were just getting to the ages where they really needed me at home at night more. 
And when I was on the morning show, I was always like looking at my clock, okay, nine o'clock, gotta go to bed, gotta go to bed, uh, gotta get the six hours of sleep. And in this case, it just, from a personal level, especially my, my little guy who was in fourth grade last year, he needed me to do his homework. He just really, really needed me much more. So personally and professionally, it's been a great move. So you didn't go to Stanford and Oxford to go be on TV. You were pre-law. So how did you end up? Uh, I know the answer, but I want, I'd love for you to tell the story of how you ended up uh, on TV. It's a pretty interesting story you tell in the book. Yeah, I think one of the greatest lessons in life, and I share this in my book as well, is that God works in mysterious ways. And we never know exactly what direction he's going to put us in, what path. And I grew up a really serious violinist as a child, and I thought that was going to be my career path. My goal as a kid was to be one of the most famous violinists in the world. And when I turned 17, I burned out. And my parents were devastated and really wanted me to find another way in which to use that talent. Who would have ever thought that a kid who battled with her weight, I mean, I was a fat kid, and put up with the taunts and the teases, and. Who would have ever thought that someday that chubby little girl who played the violin from Minnesota would end up thinking about trying to win Miss America? I mean, it was nowhere on my radar screen. But the Lord put me in that direction with my talent. My mom got a brochure in the mail when I was studying at Stanford from the Miss America organization. She called me up, I'll never forget it. She said, I found something for you to try. It says 50% of a contestant's points are based on talent. You should try this, you have the violin talent. And I said, are you nuts? I mean, it's nothing that I had ever thought about. But God works in mysterious ways. And once I sent my mind to it, set my mind to it, I decided to give it 110%. As a novice, a violin had never won. And I really put my heart and soul into it. That got me onto a whole different direction in life. And the first week I was Miss America, I was on this wonderful TV show, which all of you are too young to remember, except for maybe your teachers, which was Bloopers and Practical Jokes with Ed McMahon and Dick Clark. I remember. <laughs> and what they did was they set you up for a, a prank. The joke was on you. And so they set me up for this technological satellite that had been dubbed the Miss America that I was supposed to explain to 5,000 engineers in Washington, D.C. on live television. You, that's not, you, you didn't think you were going to be on this show called Bloopers. You, you were just no. going on a morning show. I thought I was going on this live satellite feed. And because I like to be prepared, I kept saying, well, I don't know anything about this satellite system. I need to know more information. They're like, don't worry about it. The other people on stage are going to take care of everything. Yeah, right. <laughs> so all of a sudden, the other hosts get called off, you know, emergency phone call, oh, the microphone doesn't work, and suddenly I'm standing there by myself on stage, and the floor director, just like the camera ops here, they look at me and they say, oh my gosh, we're coming to you live early in five, four, three, two, just start talking. So I gave my little one-week-old Miss America spiel about who I was and where I came from, and I stopped talking. And they said, oh no, you got to go on for 14 more minutes. <laughs> I think you have some of that agony on we, tape. We actually do. Yeah, we have. Uh, Y'all want to see a little bit of this show that your parents grew up on? Cool. Let's watch it, because I want to come back after we watch it and talk for just a second about how the Lord used that very moment to, to really change the trajectory of your life. But let's watch this together. Ed, our next practical joke victim was not all that easy to victimize. She's a cool customer. We're talking about Gretchen Carlson, the new Miss America. The victim, Gretchen Carlson, Miss America 1989. Miss America is Gretchen Carlson. Accomplices, former Miss America Marianne Mobley and her husband Gary Collins. Together they hosted the pageant and presented Gretchen with her crown. The joke took place in Denver, where Gretchen thought they were all introducing a new radio transmitting device, the multi-sync integrated satellite system, which we dubbed the Miss America. It's a total hoax. Now, as Gary and Marianne are rehearsing, Gretchen arrives very relaxed, and why not? She's been told that Gary and Marianne will handle everything. But this is supposed to be a live broadcast to a group of executives in Washington, D.C. And so our plot is about to unfold. Now, step one is to get Gary Collins out of there, so we'll tell him he's got a phone call. Step two, Marianne's out. And we're ready to tell Gretchen that the broadcast is going to happen earlier than planned. You're kidding. 
Okay, look. All right, wait. We're coming back early. Where's Gary? So you guys, find Gary. Somebody's got to find Gary. Well, there's Mary Gary Mary. and Mary Ann hiding out in the Gretchen's control room. We're going, we're going Watch early. Gretchen's face as she realizes just she has to fake it. Stand up on Gary's smile. <laughs> if you can just, just tell them what's going on. Oh. Just, just, you got to add a little bit. A little bit. Oh. Got it, got it, folks. Here we go. Five. Now remember, four, she knows absolutely three, nothing about two. the system. Hi, I'm glad to be back with you this morning. I'm Gretchen Carlson, the new Miss America. And this is my second appearance here in Denver, and it's been wonderful so far. And we're going to be introducing the multi-sync device here in a moment when Gary comes back. It's a real honor to have this named after myself. It's an honor to be Miss America and carry on a tradition. We, uh, He's telling her to talk about the system. You never know what it's going to feel like when you're actually crowned. But now it's setting in, and as I said before, I'm in Denver doing a few appearances. And I'm fortunate enough to be able to come and talk about the system here this morning, the system that's been named after Miss America. <laughs> now watch her expression okay. as uh, he tells her to stall. Oh. Whatever you want to talk about. You want to talk about the machine a little bit, whatever you can remember about it. Just, it doesn't matter. If, even if you don't understand it, just... Oh. Well, today Gary, Gary and Marianne are supposed to be here with me, and they're going to be discussing the intricate details, details about the system. My only directions are to press a few of these buttons. And I understand that at one point you can receive a shock, which I hope isn't going to happen to me during this uh, presentation. Yeah, she's already Whatever received her shock. Yeah. Whatever you can talk about. We're just, they're coming to the, they're finding them. Whatever you can talk now, about. Now, we're going to throw Gretchen a rope of sorts here, bring in cue cards okay. for her to read. Cue cards, cue cards. Of course, these are cue cards, practical joke style. Well, we're back with the new invention you've all been waiting to see, this multi-sync integrated satellite system. Now, this cue card is upside down. She's reading it anyway, Ed. She's amazing. In desperation, Gretchen is going to push some buttons. Watch what we do. Uh-oh, lights out. <laughs> oh, Ed, we've got to get this lady off the hook. Bring it. Gary and Marianne are back. Are you okay? Uh, first of all, let me apologize for kind of hanging you out to dry. <laughs> I went through the whole system, I think. <laughs> you did. Now, is it functioning okay? I'm trying to explain what was going on. Uh, then I did. pressed A1 and the lights dimmed down a little bit. That's not a good, uh, that's not supposed to happen, is it? No. We did the A. There's just one more A1. button to yeah, press D. for a message so from Gary and Marianne. A1. 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 All right. A1. Gretchen, you're a super bloopers and practical, practical jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Miss America, 1989, Gretchen Carlson. Oh, wow. Th thanks, David, for having me relive that. Now, we edited that down. There was, there was literally footage where the, the guy comes up with the cards, but they're upside down. He drops them, but you just stay cool. So um, that, that is viewed by millions and millions of people on TV. That was one of the biggest shows in, in the world at that moment. And, and I thought I was going to be fired as Miss America. Yeah. Yeah. Because but I then thought I happened? did such a horrendous job, I was embarrassed. When that came out six months later, I was in a hotel room traveling, as Miss America did, to a new city every day. I had the, the covers up over my eyes, even though I was by myself in the hotel room, because I was so embarrassed. And God works in mysterious ways, because I got calls from TV agents after that from Hollywood saying, if you can do that, you can do TV. Have you ever thought about TV? I mean, it, it ended up having the complete opposite reaction, which is such a huge lesson in life for all of us, that sometimes when we have pitfalls and failures in our life and things we think we're completely failing at, that they end up putting us in a direction where we see success. And we appreciate success and achievement so much more when we go through those difficult times. So I still took my LSATs. You know, I still thought I might go to law school, but I knew that they were good for five years. And I worked really hard to get my first job, actually right here in Virginia, Richmond, Virginia. Yeah. That's silly. That was your first TV? First gig. TV and, job. And since that moment, it, it's not always just been um, just a steady incline into greater and greater influence. You actually were, were fired. Uh, you actually, from a, a job one time, because they, they felt like having two anchor women uh, just like leading a show wasn't the right thing. You, uh, a week after I, I got married. Wow. fired and told by my boss that everything would be just fine now that I had a husband. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, my sentiments. Toughest year of my life. Um, 
I have great empathy for anyone who's ever lost their job or is struggling to still find employment because there's a certain amount of pain and shame that never ever leaves you when you go through an experience like that. And not to mention that I was newly married, which that first year of transition is difficult enough. I knew I was gonna have to move to another city too and I, my husband wasn't gonna be able to come along with me and it was a really difficult time. So I ended up moving to Dallas, Texas, which I loved. And my husband had to stay back in Cleveland, Ohio, which is where I was working at the time. And so our second year of marriage was commuting with each other. Listen, if you don't have God as your foundation through these difficult times, you don't make it, you know? And thankfully, my husband and I both had that faith and it kept us going. And you know, we both wanted to go to New York City eventually and I got that call from CBS News and we both went together. And you know, life works in great ways Absolutely. after failure. That's, that's one of the things I really appreciate about your, your new book. It, it, it just shows these mountaintop moments where you are the valedictorian and you are, uh, you know, going to Oxford and you are a part of your Miss America, but at the same time, in it, you talk about getting fired. You talk about having to go through the first year of your marriage apart from, you know, your brand new husband. You talk about having a stalker that uh, just really haunted your family for years. You, four years. You, four years, yeah. Never, never told this story before until I wrote the book. And the woman I was working with said, she knew about the story that I'd shared with her. And she said, you really have to tell the story in the book to help other women. Specifically women who are in domestic violence situations as well. And I was very fearful to tell this story because this man had terrorized my life and my family's for four years. He followed me to Richmond, Virginia for two years. He then followed me to Cincinnati, Ohio, where I worked after that for two years. He stalked my parents. And I finally got him incarcerated. But let me tell you something, at least back then, nobody cared about any stalking victim until you were dead. And I almost never got my way in television because the worst place for me to be when somebody's trying to find you is on television. And I'll never forget that my mom, my dad wasn't taking it all that seriously, not because he didn't care, he just didn't understand. And I remember my mom saying to him, do you want your daughter to end up in a wood box? You better take this seriously. And so we finally got him incarcerated and guess how much time he got? First he got probation and then he violated it so he got one year. When I was writing the book, the only way I felt safe about telling this story was to find out where is he now, because he hadn't bothered me for at least 20 years. And we found out that he was dead. And it gave me the courage to be able to write about this story and to help so many other thousands of women who have gone through this same kind of situation or a domestic violence situation. Wow. It just Adversity is nothing new. I mean, I, I, if, you have a, if, you, if you would, I'd love for you to tell the story of you had just become Miss America, and um, you go into a press conference, a room full of reporters from all over the world, and there was someone there that, and I think even in those early years, you were getting prepared for, again, bigger stages where you're always going to face adversity and challenges, like even the stalker or, or just different things that you'd gone through. Would you, would you share a little bit of that story? It's, a, it's a fascinating. Yeah, so the minute I became Miss America, they try to label you, the press does, <laughs> now that I'm a member of it. And the headline was the smart Miss America because I was at Stanford. I thought, oh, well, this is pretty good. Well, until I went to my first press conference in New York City. And there was unfortunately another female reporter who made it her mission to just take me down. She wanted to prove that I was dumb. So she gave me a test right in the middle of the press conference. She asked me about 20 questions. It was everything from what year did the Vietnam War end, you know, who's on the $50 bill, uh, you know, who's Mary Jo Kopechny, uh, all these sort of historical questions. And then she got to, have you ever done drugs? And finally, have you ever had sex? At which point in time, the chairman of the pageant got up and went over to her, and the entire press corps in New York City booed her. I don't know if that's ever happened ever again. And it really made me realize, wow, there are gonna be people in this world who are gonna take me down just because. And it's a great life lesson for all of us to know. 
because whether it's social media or me being on television now talking about my faith and having all the haters come out, you have to have self-esteem built from the inside of your soul to be able to take that on and say, I don't give a you-know-what about what you're saying about me because I feel good about myself. Amen. Because really, the, the, the one whose opinion matters is God. And God has fearfully and wonderfully made you, and He's for you. So is that how you deal with criticism? Because it's funny, it's ironic that the first time you were made very known to the public, you were known as the smart Miss America, because honestly, because you played the violin, and you, you were very academic, and you came from Stanford and Oxford. And then today, uh, people kind of mislabel you as, uh, you said in the book, you say the, uh, the, the bimbo trifecta? Yeah, I coined the phrase. <laughs> what, what is that? What is I don't know if anyone else can, uh, I don't know if they'd want to earn that title, but uh, anyway, blonde. That's Former you. Miss America. That's you. And working at Fox News. There you go, That's bimbo you. trifecta. <laughs> so people so just want to with take that you kind down. Of criticism? Yeah, you know what? Listen, David, if I read all the negativity about me on a daily basis, I wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. And so why bother? Uh, it's not going to stop me from talking about my faith, for example. I'm one of the very few national news anchors that, that does do that. Right. And I get immense blowback for that. Um, you know, I'm sure we all know people in this world that we'd like to be able to walk up to and say, you know, get revenge to a certain extent. I can't believe you said that about me, and let me tell you, I've only done that really once in my life, and it was that reporter. So again, God works in mysterious ways. About 12 years later, I ran into her, and we were both working in New York City. I was working for CBS News, and she was working for a local station. And I saw her, and I thought, should I say something? And I decided, yep, it was uncharacteristic for me. So I got done with my live reports, and I went up to her. She had no idea who I was. And I reintroduced myself. I said, hi, Penny. I said, I'm Gretchen Carlson. I was the Miss America that you humiliated and tried to take down. And I just want to let you know that I'm now a CBS News correspondent, and you're not. That's what you did. That's what you did. That's what you did. <laughs> you can't do that all the time. Yeah. We'll put that on our prayer request list and for then, you. And then I prayed for her. You prayed for her. Thank you. So then you just Jesus juked it. You were just, you nailed her. And then you, after you did that, you prayed for her. Of That's course. awesome. Of course. But the most important lesson for us is that we can't do that with everyone that we get angry with or tries to take us down. But I got to tell you, it did feel good. Yeah. <laughs> it is so true, though, isn't it, that, uh, that hurt people hurt people. And when we get to, when we go beyond this person who's just really not interested in being accurate, they're just interested in being hurtful, a lot of times something in their past brought them to that moment. And I think what I love about your book is it's very disarming because you're just saying, look, I, I, I dealt with um, infertility issues in my life. I dealt with obesity in my life. I dealt with uh, loneliness in my life. I dealt with a lot of things as well. And it just shows that everyone has a path. It's not always as shiny as everybody thinks that it is or, or, or whatever. Uh, last question here, just really interested. Your, your husband, by the way, is a big time sport agent, right? Over a hundred, almost 140 different big time baseball players, football players. Casey is well known around the world. He's one of the top agents in the entire world. He's very, very busy. You're very, very busy. And you're, so you're a mom, you're on TV, you're promoting your brand new book. You're just everywhere doing everything. So. Uh, how do you manage all of that? How do you tell us about balance and priorities? Uh, we, we're a lot of these students are beginning their lives and 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 walking into getting a full time job, getting a, a ring by spring, you know, and getting all the things that it takes. So, uh, what does that look like? Priorities and commitment and time management for two very very busy people like you and Casey. Well, luckily we both believe in the Lord, so that is our number one priority. Uh, Number two, I say in the book that I think this whole idea of having it all, whether it's for women or for men, is a curse. It sets us up for expectations that we can't achieve, and so then we feel guilt. And I don't want any of you to feel that. It 
is about giving 110% in the moment, but you can't do that for everything all at the same time. Unrealistic. So I like to say when I'm at work, I'm giving 110% to Fox News, but then I'm not giving it to my kids. And when I go home, I'm giving my kids 110% and not to Fox News. So I like to say that you can have it all, just not all at the same time, and let's stop making everyone feel guilty in our society that they have to live up to those expectations. Yeah, that's, that's valuable advice, good wisdom for our students, for all of us, really. So you, you're talking about the myth of having it all and the myth of constant balance. And I love what you just said. I think it's definitely tweet-worthy, hint, hint here, uh, that uh, you said being 110% in the moment. And so when your mom, be 110% in the moment. When you're on TV, be 100%, you know, just 10% committed in that moment, right? Exactly. And I don't pass judgment on anyone's decision about what they want to do in their lives. So whether you want to work in the workplace or you want to work the full-time job at home, raising kids, I value all of that the same. And I was just sharing with Amy driving down here that when I take a day off from work and I spend it at home, I'm more busy than when I actually go to work. Being a full-time mom at home is a huge job, or dad, and I value that. So it's a personal choice for everyone to determine how they want to strike that balance and I don't pass judgment on anyone's decisions. It's powerful. Uh, this is the last question. It's, uh, it's the common question we ask all of our distinguished guests that come. And I, and I want you to know, I always say this in front of our guests. Uh, I think our students get tired of hearing it sometimes, but we, we mean this. We don't just uh, say this to sound uber spiritual. We, we really want to know how we can pray for you in this particular season uh, of your life. First of all, we're grateful for you. We're grateful that you're a, a witness and an ambassador for Christ Thank you, David. all over the world. But um, how can we pray for you? Like, that's the question. We end, uh, you know, whether it's a politician or a TED Talk speaker or a great athlete and we're in Q&A, we want to know how we, whenever we see you on TV at 2 o'clock, you know, say, oh, Gretchen asked us to pray about this for her and her family. Uh, how can we pray for you? Thank you so much. The last chapter in my book is to whom much is given, much is expected. And I believe that's the second greatest lesson that we can teach our young people how important it is to give back. And so I would just really love for you to pray for my children, first and foremost, because they are the loves of my life and I'm so blessed to have them. And my parents, because I was given an amazing foundation in life and I am so blessed to still have them in my life. And so I would just ask that you would pray for the people in my life that make my life fulfilled, which would be my children, my husband, and my parents. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. We, we're going to do that, all right? Let's, let's do that right now. Can we pray for you right now? Thank you. Father, I thank you for this sister in Christ. Thank you, Lord, that um, you used a godly grandfather, a pastor, a godly parents, Lord, to allow her to be trained up in the ways that she should go so that then, Father, she would not depart from it in this season of her life. I pray that that would be imparted back down to the next generation, her own children. Lord, I thank you for the witness that she is, but I pray, God, that you would put a hedge of protection that would protect her reputation. Lord, those who, who come to harm, I pray that they would, they would see no success. That, God, those who come to hurt, that they would see even in that a witness and a testimony of someone who can love them despite the way that they've been treating her. Father, we pray for a sustainable pace for Gretchen. Lord, in this very busy season, we pray that, that, find, that, that she'd find margin, God, that she'd find time with her family, with her kids, and, and God, give her the supernatural ability to be able to be 110% in the moment with the people that you put in her path. Lord, I pray that she'll know that she's amongst family, that she'll leave here today knowing that her brothers and her sisters in Christ, uh, sons and daughters of the same Heavenly Father, are always for her. That when she goes on TV, she'll know that if a Liberty student's watching, uh, that we're going to pray for her, that we stand in the gap with her. We pray this in your name. Amen.